I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of discussions on the New South Wales Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill. Joining us for an update today, we have two guests. First of all, Ms Shane Hickson, who is Vice President of Dying with Dignity New South Wales and who has been pushing for these laws to come into effect in New South Wales for almost 10 years now. Shane, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here again. We're also joined by Mr Greg Connell, who is also a Dying with Dignity advocate and a long-term member of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. He has been trying to make contact with his local member, Mr Robert Borzak, seeking to have, to have his party express their support for the bill, but so far to no avail. Greg, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Shane, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Last year, there was talk that it may get through before the end of the year. That wasn't the case, even though it passed the lower house with a resounding win and survived the subsequent committee inquiry. It's now before the upper house and where there was talk at one stage it could be passed in April. However, that didn't happen. Can you talk to us about why that didn't occur and where it is on the parliamentary calendar now? Well, Suzanne, uh, the thing is, it's the legislation in New South Wales, unlike Victoria, Western Australia and Queensland, our legislation is a private member's bill. So when it reached the upper house following the recommendation of the inquiry, it really was only allowed to have time to be debated on the private members day, which is a Wednesday in the sitting weeks. And there's a lot of other business uh, that uh, needs to be done on those days. Uh, so it takes a lot of uh, support to get enough hours because obviously this legislation is, is very complex. Um, it's very important. Uh, and also most uh, members of the upper house would want to speak about their position. So speak, do their second reading speech. So realistically, it could have dragged on for months and months and months. And of course, they didn't sit um, in, uh, in April at all. So we only had two Wednesdays in March. So we put a lot of pressure on, um, both by having rallies outside Parliament House. We again had to do a joint um, advertisement in the two major papers, uh, joint with Go Gentle Australia, the other advocacy group, um, in order to really try and let the upper house members know how important this issue is. And that campaign was titled, They Died Waiting. So we highlighted the numbers of people who have died waiting for a law on assisted dying to bars in New South Wales. Fortunately, that, um, that pressure did work and we were given or the um, government, the opposition and the crossbench all gave up a little bit of time. So I think it ended up being about maybe a total of six hours uh, in March over those two Wednesdays. So we did get through a number of speeches. We got through 33 out of the 42 members. And fortunately, after hearing those speeches, we uh, crossed the critical number, which was 21 to have a majority. We actually had, have uh, up to this point, had 22 members of the upper house speak in support of the legislation. Uh, then there's been obviously the and 11 has spoke uh, in opposition to the legislation. So that then there was a long wait, obviously, uh, all through April, and they will sit again uh, next Wednesday. So the 11th of May is when the debate will resume. And uh, we expect uh, the, that the last of the speeches will be done on that day, and hopefully we will reach a second reading vote. Sorry. Greg Connell, last time you and I spoke, you were still trying to get in touch with your student species and farmers MP, Mr Borzak. He's refused to speak to my office and yours and he's communicating as far as I'm aware with any advocacy organisation either. Can you give us an update on that? Have you heard from them? And where does, where does that whole thing go from here? Uh, yeah, I really don't know how Mr Borzak can sit in Parliament because he has a major communication problem that... Um, where, where it's at is uh, that uh, if you try and debate him on uh, any uh, subject that he uh, doesn't agree with you, uh, he basically shuts you down to the point that uh, I've been totally blocked from any Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party social media uh, what's, whatsoever. So, um, he, uh, yeah, he, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, I... I don't know how how you can have a member of parliament who supposedly represents you uh, 
and doesn't want to communicate. Uh, he's he's indicated in the past that he will not communicate at all with the Greens, um, which obviously you would know about. And uh, it's you know you might agree with someone, but uh, as you can see, me sitting here now, we have fundamental differences. But I still talk to you, so you, you still got to you still got to communicate. But the, the really sad point is that he doesn't communicate with his members. He, he expects people to pay money to his party and and to vote for him. But uh, yeah, that's all I want you to do. So uh, yeah, so basically, there's no communication at all. Originally, shooters and fishers were expected to vote against this, and given their refusal to communicate with anybody, there's no reason to believe that's changed. But from what I can gather, perhaps Shane, you can answer this: Is there is there people on the cross bench or or um, other players involved who have changed their minds and decided they will now vote for it in the upper house? Well, we we've had um, uh, already one MP that voted uh, against the legislation last time, well, at least one. In fact, I think more than one. But uh, Catherine Kuzak, a Liberal MP, uh, voted against the bill in in 2017. She spoke in support of the bill, uh, so that was that was good to see. And um, I'm trying to think of the others, but uh, as far as the shooters, uh, the two shooters go, um, Robert Borsak spoke. Um, against the legislation in his second reading speech, but he also indicated that Mark Benaziak, the other upper house shooter, would join him. Now, Mark hasn't spoken himself, so I think that means that he still, you know, potentially could support it. I mean, until they actually get to the second reading vote, and not everyone has to speak, it's not compulsory, we don't know. So it is possible that pressure from uh, people like uh, Greg and, and others, because Greg has been able to inspire a lot of uh, upper house members, uh, sorry, uh, so, sorry, shooters, supporters to to contact uh, the two upper house shooters. Um, I, I never give up. I'm an optimist in this campaign. Having even though I've seen uh, this, you know, two bills go down since my mum died of brain cancer, I'm still the optimist in the organisation, and I, I still trust that that people there are enough MPs who care. Um, you know, I, I would have expected a much bigger majority, really, if everybody did care. But there's a lot of other things at play. But I, the, the lower house shooters, all three of the lower house shooters supported the bill. They listened to their constituents. There's enormous support in their party uh, and people and, and the type of people that vote mainly for the shooters who live in the regional areas. Uh, the, the levels of support for voluntary assisted dying are very high. So even though Greg may not have been able to get through to uh, Robert Borsak, perhaps he's the pressure that he's put on, uh, that that party will have, have an influence on Mark Benaziak. Now, all the politics aside, as with most people who are involved in the movement to try and get voluntary assisted dying approved in New South Wales, you both have harrowing personal stories of your own. In Greg's case, it must be particularly difficult because I know Sarah is very unwell now too and she's also an advocate for voluntary assisted dying. It must be very frustrating, Greg, and very difficult for you both at the moment to see it so close to getting across the line, not being able to get in touch with your own representative about it, having Sarah so sick. How are you both going with all that? Do you, do you get the support you need? Where do people like you go to get support at a time like this? Oh, you have your family, uh, you know, like uh, my, my sister is also a, uh, a massive supporter of it, though she's a silent supporter because she finds it difficult to talk about my father's death. Um, as for Sarah and myself, you know, like we just bounce off each other. It's it's that relationship. Um she actually is not too bad at the moment, to tell you the truth. Um, to look at her, you wouldn't know she had um, cholangiocarcinoma or liver cancer. Um, and uh, health-wise, she's, uh, uh, we just had an uh, appointment yesterday. She's doing very well, um, so, which is good. We take that as a, as a blessing. And uh, she has three monthly checks. And so you live life day by day it's sometimes it's it's difficult and it gets to you um but um yeah we have each other at the moment we have our family so yeah we just keep going along day by day it's pretty insulting isn't it when someone like you who is a high profile advocate well known in the shooters and fishers party and if they generation shooter for god's sake and they can't even return your phone call and as i said in a previous discussion in relation to this when you've got a shooters and fishers member and a 
and, and a green left reporter on the same side, you'd think maybe the representatives have realised they've missed the boat. Shane, you yourself, of course, have been an advocate for many years after seeing your poor mum pass away from terrible brain cancer. It's so close to the finish, yes, it must be quite stressful for you when there's only so few votes in it. How are you going with all that now? Well, yeah, it, it, you know, I don't want to get my hopes up too high, but at this stage we do think that we have the numbers uh, in the upper house. It's not a big majority, but you only need a majority of one. And um, so I do feel that this, is, this will be the time that hopefully within the next couple of weeks um, we will see this law pass at long last, nearly 10 years since my mum died, uh, so it, that it has just filled my life. I have support from my daughter and my partner all through the process since mum passed away to be an advocate for this law reform. But it's also, you know, when it when it gets tough, I just think of the all the people who've had terminal illness who've used the last, you know, weeks and months of their own lives campaigning for this law reform, but knowing that the law would not come into effect uh, in time to help them. And that gives me strength because if they've got the, you know, the courage and the, and the, you know, willpower to keep going and speak up, then it's the very least that I can do because touch wood, I have my health. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting excited. I feel that that we will have the numbers. And as long as something like COVID doesn't happen, because I'm unfortunately, as we all know, um, people are getting COVID left, right and centre now, and it only takes a couple of supporters, uh, you know, in the upper house to catch COVID next week, and that changes everything. So um, I, I just recently got over COVID myself, so part of me was thinking, well, at least it's not next week when I when I have a rally to organise. Uh, so, yeah, we've just got to hope that nothing like that happens. Any last words, Greg, do you think maybe you... Do you have a, a, a final observation in relation to whether or not it'll get approved this time? Oh, look, I'm like Shane. I'm a, I'm a believer and I do believe it'll be uh, it'll pass this time. Um, the weight of support across the state, across the country, you know, like it's it's overwhelming and people like Mr Borzak and Benaziak can't keep ignoring that. They might want to. We, we all know, well, look, it's, it's pretty obvious from Mr Borzak's speech in Parliament that he's in cahoots with uh, Fred and I and the Christian Democrats, uh, quoting hope and uh, Catholic healthcare systems. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's obviously very one-sided and a uh, bit of a shame, really, you know, like, but um, seriously, like, when someone like that advertises out here and wants country New South Wales to represent, wants, wants to represent country New South Wales and he's living in Ashfield in Sydney, well, um, you know, that's not a country party for me. Um, you know, everyone out here knows, like, if you, if you find someone that talks in the, in, as a member of the party, everyone knows Phil Donato is the leader in waiting. Um, Robert should just back down and move away and, and let, the, let the party progress. It's, um, it's as simple as that. Um, but it's never going to progress with him as leader. <clears throat> Well, thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank you, Greg Connell. Yeah, not a problem. And thank you, Shane Hickson. You're welcome, Suzanne. Good to speak to you. Thank you very much for that update on the New South Wales Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill, which hopefully, fingers crossed, will get through the upper house in the next month or two. Thank you very much to Shane Hickson, who is Vice President of Dying with Dignity New South Wales and longtime VAD advocate. And also Mr Greg Connell, also a Dying with Dignity advocate and sounds like soon to be former member of the Shooters and Fishers Party. Thank you both very much for joining us. This Thank is Susan for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.